Well, thank you very much, and uh, <coughs> my thanks to the organizers and, um, for putting together this fascinating program and inviting us to participate. Um, this is um, a highly unusual kind of invitation to come to us. And uh, as we offer our thanks, um, I think many of those who were invited were struck by the language of the invitation. Um, I was in particular the reference to the fact that a child born today may well be alive in a hundred years' time. So this is not an entirely theoretical conversation. Uh, and it so happened that last year I had three new grandsons born to three different families, um, you and Gideon and Lincoln. And I had these little boys in my mind as I accepted the invitation and as I have been reflecting upon uh, the nature of our conversations this week. So thank you very much uh, to those who have put together this very um, far-sighted and far-reaching discussion. All speculative exercises are heavily freighted with assumptions. And perhaps the most useful single thing we could be doing this week is um, sharing our assumptions as we get into this conversation and explaining why we make them. And I want to begin by sharing three of mine. First, uh, to put it uh, in these terms, we are a young species, we members of Homo sapiens. A very young species in biological time, but a very, very young species in geological, let alone cosmological time. And we've all seen these, these um, graphs showing how very late in, in the process, even of biological change, uh, Homo sapiens has, has come together. And we inherit, um, it seems to me, if you like, the baton of a very young species. And that, I think, has all sorts of implications for how we look at the future, partly, I think, in encouraging us not to go the way of those who want to frame these discussions in primarily technological terms. Uh, indeed, those who want to talk about post-humanism and transhumanism and H+, seems to me we're talking simply about, you know, we, we, we've learned to crawl, we're learning to toddle. We humans, at this early stage in the development of our species, are now looking at developing new tools and what they imply. And we have no need at all to rebrand ourselves as something other than members of Homo sapiens. A young species. Secondly... We are entitled, it seems to me, to take a view which I would describe as non-naive optimism. Um, that is to say, there are those in the technological community in particular who many of us regard as naive optimists. They will dismiss all sorts of negatives, concerns. Technology will solve its own problems. It'll solve everybody's problems. End of conversation. Well, no, beginning of conversation. We, I think, need to assume an optimism which is, if you like, on the far side of a consideration of risk, uncertainty, and the unknown. But as a methodological principle, it seems to me it is crucial that we assume a qualified, non-naive optimism, um, not least, um, as otherwise, if essentially the alternative is a sort of doomsday futurism, um, there is no interest in that, and I think it does not actually help our conversations about how we can prepare ourselves, not least for the challenges in getting from here into the future. So I believe we should strive for an optimism on the far side of an awareness of challenges and risks as we soberly prepare ourselves for the continuation of the extraordinarily rapid change to which we're becoming increasingly used. Third assumption. I don't believe we have any right to expect a fundamental shift in the commingling of good and evil in the typical member of our species, Homo sapiens. The Jekyll and Hyde in all of us and those <laughs> in whom Mr. Hyde is far more evident than Dr. Jekyll. That is to say, in our assumptions about the world order in a hundred years' time and the changes which will take place to prepare for that world order, I think we have to assume that the, if you like, the pathologies which we have become used to in the history of the social order are going to persist, both between tribes, between nations, ideologies, and in the individuals who, of course, compose, compose the human race. So I make those three assumptions. And uh, interestingly, the, um, those of you who know Washington may know that uh, in the committee room of the science committee, 
of the House of Representatives. On the wall, there's a very interesting quotation from Tennyson, the 19th century English poet. His early poem, Locksley Hall, a very visionary poem in which he imagines um, air travel and all kinds of things. And it begins with the, the line, I looked into the future as far as I could see. Interestingly, that uh, quotation on the wall of the committee room of the Science Committee does not include, I think, the most uh, sobering phrase in the poem. That is to say, the phrase, knowledge comes, but wisdom lingers. And it seems to me, if there is a, if there is a banner to set um, around the technological future conversation, it is this one, knowledge comes, but wisdom lingers. And wisdom itself is not a product of technology. It is a product of humans, human society, the human mind, the human vision. And the kindling of wisdom as we engage with the new knowledge uh, seems to me to be uh, the, um, the prime, the prerequisite as we would engage the future. So three, three, three assumptions. Um, the fundamental assumption that this is a human discussion, that we are members of homo sapiens, and that we're talking about tools, which I'm delighted to see as the, the banner of, of this session, tools for the future, um, is a fundamental reminder to us that, that humans are tool-making creatures. We are homo faber, man the maker, the ads and the wheel are early tools we made, and the internet has been the latest and the most extraordinarily productive uh, general purpose technology, to use the term that the, that the academics use. Um, and that we need to frame our understanding of these tools as tools, as we look at their significance, um, that this is a, a human race. And that is to say the tendency to suggest that wetware is somehow inferior to software and hardware, that we need to uh, like, uh, proportion ourselves to be more like our tools uh, and, and, and less like the people whom we have been in the history of the human race, seems to me to be, um, to be a flawed way of thinking and certainly an unhelpful way of thinking uh, because, because this is a fundamentally human, human exercise. And so our technology is fundamentally a subset of our, if you like, our anthropology. And this framing of the question uh, seems to me to be central to our forming a vision of where we're going and how we ought to be seeking uh, to get there. Now, to toward 2115, plainly, um, if we are non-naive uh, optimists, we can make some sort of predictions. We at least think they're liable to be around then, or at least as a working hypothesis, we can, <laughs> we can envisage ourselves as being around then. Um, we are, of course, aware of the whole succession of existential threats, which increasingly have been articulated, and I think which need to be articulated. Um, as we do predict what um, may be happening in 2115, uh, whether it's you know, the rogue nanobots or whether it's um, an AI apocalypse or whatever it is, and the list keeps lengthening. Some of you may know Martin Rees's little book about, about um, risk, published, I don't know, 10, 12 years ago. I mean, a profound summary by one of the greatest minds of our day of a whole succession of existential risks. Um, we need to address these risks even as we assume um, that we will get beyond them. Now, the world of 2115 that we're discussing is, if you like, a world for people like us. That is to say, for those who are among the economic and intellectual elite, uh, those who are part of the West, quote-unquote, however we understand the people like us um, uh, fr framing of the discussion. And plainly, one of the fundamental questions is whether we shall have come up with ways of resolving the fundamental inequities, economic and, and power inequities, which have been at the heart of the human experience um, all along. And because I don't believe, sad to say, that Silicon Valley can produce, if you like, additional wisdom for the human community and can solve our, our moral dilemmas, uh, let alone our lack of moral vision, um, it, I think it is entirely unclear. And I think we need to do scenario planning here and assume on the one hand that we may well end up with a world in which the current inequities are baked in to this high-tech order which we're moving into. 
even if we might wish for and also seek to prepare for a world in which we found a way to address them. I think it's entirely unclear. Um, interestingly, one of the good news and bad news elements, which I think looking ahead is plainly going to be the case, is, is that work as we know it will be over. Work in the sense in which we've been familiar with work in the industrial and indeed in the information societies will be a thing of the past. How dramatic this experience is as we get from here to there will depend partly on our addressing this issue of inequity, very plainly. And the good news seems to me to be that as we move beyond the traditional industrial information society notion of work, I think we may be forced to come up with what we might call non-socialist models of redistribution. Whether we're talking about basic, basic income, basic wage approaches, there are various models that are out there and which I think we are maybe forced into in such a way that there's a recognition that this is no longer an issue of you know, the right, the left, should we distribute more, should it be all up to you whether you have a job or whether you don't. Um, there's a sort of heaven and hell option here. We may end up moving toward the heaven option simply by force of necessity and the need to come up with a reshaping of the discussion out of its traditional left, right wing capitalism versus socialist terms. I don't know, but I think that, that that's certainly one of the elements in the world of 2115, is that work as we know it will plainly be over. Because it's very plain that we're going to end up with all sorts of robotic, AI, algorithmic ways of achieving the things that create value. Um, and essentially, if we no longer need people in the value equation, then the traditional work model is done. Secondly, it seems plain also, and I'm talking here about the things that I think we can probably all agree are likely to be the case, we shall be living longer. Now, whether we should be living for 300 years, that's unlikely. It's very plain, of course, looking at the history of demographics, we're all living longer all the time. Year by year by year, we may expect radical breakthroughs, as we were hearing yesterday, in a number of areas, that, uh, of, of disease areas, which will significantly advance our capacity to live longer. Whether we shall breach this sort of barrier that seems to be there at around 120 years, I think is entirely unclear. But we shall be around for longer, we shall be healthy for longer, and we shall therefore be economic, um, <laughs> have economic needs, but also be economic generators for longer if we can find a new way to generate, to generate wealth as individuals, rather than simply having capital generating wealth, which I think increasingly may well be the model we have to face. And in this context, of course, then there are also a, there are threats. The end of antibiotics, which the World Health Organization is now, is now warning us is a serious possibility. The emergence, of course, of completely new diseases, diseases coming out of other species, um, all sorts of, of, of um, exogenous threats. But a reasonable assumption that we're all going to be living very significantly longer. And one of the things that interestingly means is we're going to have much more complex intergenerational relationships. Uh, with children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, parents. All sorts of very interesting new social patterns will emerge in a context in which we perhaps typically live until we're 110 years old, rather than typically until we're, until we're in our 70s, which, is, which has been the model for this last generation. Thirdly, it seems to me plain that our social uh, capacities, our social experiences, will be greatly enhanced. One of the things that I find interesting and encouraging in this last generation of, of course, technological development is the prevalence of the term social and of social categories. So we have social enterprise, social responsibility, as well as, of course, social networking. Um, but at the heart of our notions of business now, our notions of social value, uh, with Michael Porter's notion, ultimately, of, of what I've called his own singularity, of, of, of shared value, that ultimately social value and economic value are going to come to a single point. Um, th th I think there are many encouragements in, in the, the, the social framing of questions uh, in the context of this technological explosion. Um, but certainly, as we move ahead 100 years, we're going to have far more enhanced capacities for social engagement. Plainly, we will have direct brain-to-brain -brain engagement. We can already do that kind of thing in a limited way. Um, we won't need to type. We won't need to <laughs> get the emails. Um, how we will sift and sort information coming in directly into our brains, we don't know. But plainly, mechanisms will be devised. So all 7 billion people, or 10 billion, or however many billion it is, will have the kind of communication with possibilities with each other, which now we have essentially using our mobile devices. 
this is going to be there. I think there'll be other interesting things that we've always been referred to, the fact that we're going to plenty to have AIs as companions, as pets, as lovers, um, as it may well be government officials, all sorts of robotic opportunities will be there, which could be brought into the human community, certainly will operate on the social principle of our human community by analogy, and that these uh, new experiences will be combined perhaps with new kinds of communication with animals, which I really find an interesting sort of set of developments here. Um, plainly, you know, as we know, the, um, I mean, the corvids and, you know, the, the cetaceans and our dogs and so on, we now know there's an awful lot more intelligence there than we ever realized. New ways of tapping into that intelligence and of engaging with, with non-human creatures. And, of course, it may well be we shall finally find a way of resolving the Fermi paradox and communicating with other species in other parts of the universe. Um, all kinds of social options, social possibilities within the framing of this most social of species, which is, which is Homo sapiens. Same time, as we know, and this has already, of course, been adverted to, we will by then be straddling many other worlds. It's a very strange thing, particularly from an American point of view, and I've for a long time now been a sort of temporary or borrowed American. Um, for 40 years, we froze the space program. Not many people realized back in the late 1960s, 5% of the U.S. federal budget went to NASA. 5%. It's now about 0.5%. We've reawoken interest in space, partly because, because of global competition in space and the Indian move to Mars and so on, fascinating new developments. Finally, we're interested again in exploring beyond this Earth. And in the course of the next hundred years, we may expect very, very rapid developments as humans come to colonize other parts, certainly, of, of our solar system, which I think will help redefine our notion of ourselves as a species. I think that the question of identity is going to be tied up in all of these developments. And fifthly, um, it seems to me humans are liable to have made all sorts of very different decisions about the application of technology to their lives, their social lives, personal lives, national lives. Um, one book which I love is Neil Stevenson's book, The Diamond Age, one of his earlier books, his nanotechnology book, um, which in fact, it's, it, the scenario there is of a world in which different peoples have very different kinds of uses of technology, and that there are those um, who are completely sort of techno-geeky, nerdy freaks, and there are those who essentially use technology to live another life. And so the superior race in that vision, it's a good deal of humor, of course, in his writing, is the Anglo-American successor race, who are called the Victorians, and have a Queen Victoria, but they write the code. They are the wealthiest of these communities, and they don't spend their money living in a techno society, they have tea parties, and the girls wear pretty frocks, and the men wear, wear um, um, top hats. And they've created a suit. Point about the book, which I, one of the points about the book, which I find fascinating, is that there's no technological reduction necessary in our vision of the human future. Different societies, different kinds of people could make very different decisions about how they integrate technology into their lives at a time when technology is so richly available as we believe it will be, either for some, or perhaps for the many, and that will perhaps be the single biggest decision which requires to be made of the human community as we, as we move ahead. Well, drawing, drawing toward a conclusion, three matters which to me are entirely unclear. One is this issue of inequality and how we resolve it, if we resolve it, and whether we end up with a world in which it is baked into the next hundred years, or whether we find ways to undermine the assumptions which, over the last generations, have essentially maintained fundamental inequalities. And these are tied in partly with governance issues. We're talking about Africa. I mean, amazing explosion of mobile, Africa enterprise, all sorts of fascinating technology actually taking root in African countries without having to go through what happened in the West. And yet governance models and all sorts of other sets of implications which are holding back um, the capacity of other societies um, to live as, as we do in the West. Second area of fundamental uncertainty is, of course, the issue of asymmetric insecurity. The sons and daughters of ISIS. Whether we will live in a world in which constantly um, there is, if you like, a sort of low-level war being waged. Of course, 
engaging in our technologies. And talking yesterday, informally, some of us have been the whole issue of cyber physical systems, Internet of Things, the way basically every single component on the planet is, unless we do something about it, going to end up being interconnected. So with one QWERTY keyboard, you can essentially engage. Famous example of the, the, the Jeep, which could have crashed in California through a, a, white, a, a white hat hacker. Um, captured people's imagination, but the notion that, you know, with current connected car systems in place, somebody with a keyboard could ensure that on Monday morning at a quarter past nine, a million cars turn left. And the implications of that kind, that kind of attack, it's one thing to lose your, have your social security number and your visa number out there on the internet. Cyber physical systems raise enormously the risk element involved in these technologies. Um, and how that issue is resolved is entirely unclear to me. It may well be that we have disasters, and you get two or three disasters of that kind, and the world will move back toward analog systems. You know, the story is they're now buying typewriters in the Kremlin, and that could be one of, one of the stories of our day. And the third area of uncertainty, whether what I call the human imperative will actually prevail. This is entirely unclear, but it seems to me that uh, I hope when the Champalimau Foundation celebrates its 110th birthday in 2015, I doubt whether any of us will be invited back, but perhaps we shall. Um, perhaps our grandchildren will be invited, invited here in uh, 100 years' time. I hope still we will wish to come together. I hope still we'll wish to have cocktails in, in, in the monastery before dinner. I hope we'll, we'll still wish to assemble panels um, in, in, in real life, uh, to, use, to use the phrase we use. Um, because this human thing is, ir is irreducible uh, in our species, and abstractions from it have so much value, but they're ultimately abstractions from this kind of event which the Foundation has brought together, and I hope that will prevail. Thank you very much.